Um, you're going to now hear from uh, Philip Stern. He has a PhD in uh, physics from Cambridge University and is an assistant professor at university in um, San Francisco. And he's going to tell us about machine learning and Python. Cool. Okay. And I will try and keep it nice and lively. I know that you've all got a bunch of food busy digesting from a nice lunch. So hopefully I can keep you awake, keep things animated. Um, I used to work for Take A Lot and I pulled some connections. So if you answer or, or if you ask a really nice question, I have a 200 Rand gift voucher to hand out. And I, I've got a couple of them. So let's keep it a little bit lively, keep it interesting, keep it moving along. Cool. So, Gaussian what, huh? Um, hopefully you know a little bit about Gaussian processes, but I'm not assuming anything. So, a Gaussian distribution is just a normal distribution by another name. It's literally a synonym, and the normal distribution pops up all over statistics. So, if you've got any sort of technical background, you've probably seen it. If you hear any sort of polls or anything like that, and they give an error error bars, those error bars are normally distributed, usually. Um, and so you can extend this, so you can start thinking about, well, what does a normal distribution in one dimension look like? Well, it's going to move one way or the other. In two dimensions, you can ha start having interesting correlations and these sorts of things start kicking in. A Gaussian process takes things to 11. It goes crazy and it multiplies it by infinity. Okay, And we now have an infinite dimensional Gaussian distribution. Now, conceptually, that's weird. Like, what does that mean? So, hopefully, I'm going to be able to convince you with a simple demo, and this is the only live demo I'm going to do, because I don't like live demos. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Um, I'm going to run this a couple times, so it's going to go through once and go through twice. So we're going to see some data, and when we see some data, we're going to say, well, let's put dimension one here, dimension two, dimension three, dimension four, dimension five, da 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 da, -da all the way up to dimension gazillion. And we're going to condition on some of the data points that we know, and we're going to say our data, our predictions need to be close to the data, and in these other dimensions, or we're going to then make predictions about these other dimensions because they're close to the data, we know that they have to be somehow close to the values we observe. And as you end up seeing more and more data, you end up being able to estimate roughly the error bars and roughly the mean function and all these sorts of interesting things. And what's nice is you can also draw samples from these functions, so you can say, Okay, here's some data. Let's draw some functions. And this rainbow is sort of a bunch of functions that we've drawn from this very high dimensional Gaussian distribution. And all you have to think about is, okay, we now can think in the sort of cool space of functions. So we can say, let's draw a sample from, if we believe that this data is somehow smooth, and we've seen a bunch of this data. Let's draw some samples from this data, and what does it look like? And that can be a very useful thing. So this is a generative model um, in machine learning. You can draw samples from it. OK, and yeah, so there's the gray line where the underlying data was generated from. And you can see that all the samples, once you see enough data, all your samples for your mean and all that end up converging to the truth. And that's really cool because this is a, what another thing that's known as is a non-parametric model. And that means that you don't have to specify very many parameters. And as it goes, so we see a little bit of data, and then as we see more and more, we get to converge on these things. Okay, we've gone a surprisingly long time without any take a lot vouchers. <laughs> yes. So, um, Do we need it? Oh, I can repeat the. Hi. So to be honest, I'm a tiny bit lost. You have the grey line, 
Um, is that where points are being generated using a Gaussian distribution around the gray line from as like... Okay, so there's an underlying function, and in this case, I think it's a sinusoidal type thing. And you're absolutely right. What I do is I go and I draw some, I add some noise to it, and that sort of models what happens in the real world is there are noisy processes, there's noisy measurement errors and, and all those sorts of things. And as you get to see more and more, then your estimate converges to the true mean. And <coughs> it's not like you're fitting a line, and if you see something that's not a line, you'll try and fit the best line to it. It's literally you're working in the space of functions, so any sort of nice smooth function can be... Yes? Why are the functions smooth then? Um, if, if, if if you represent a whole bunch of dimension, dimensions on the x-axis, surely each x and x plus 1 aren't correlated at all, so why does the function remain so smooth? Okay, so this is fantastic. I'm going to give you one as well. <laughs> so what determines that these things are smooth is a covariance function. And the covariance function will say how correlated you have to be with your neighbors. And you can start saying, okay, well, let's have a very long length scale, is the name, and that means that you have to be very correlated with all your neighbors. And typically that means that the, the function is going to change very smoothly. And if you pick something like an RBF, just let's call it that for now, then you're going to live in this nice smooth world. Um, in other cases, you can have exponentials and other things that drop off much faster, and then your functions can be much more wiggly, and you can start thinking about modeling um, things like stock prices and things like that, because those look wiggly. Okay, so we've got a tool, and what can we, we've got a hammer, what can we hit? So let's look at some data, and Google recently released some interesting data that's supposed to be for showing how great BigQuery is. So I wrote a little Python script that promptly pulled all the data out of BigQuery, and then I could play around with it in Python. It's got data for the whole world, but because this is a South African Python conference, I just restricted it to, Py to South Africa. Um, and some of the data goes back as far as 1850, which is kind of cool. Um, it's only, back then, it's only sort of they had only a single weather station in South Africa, and it was, how much did it rain today? <laughs> but yeah, okay, so I wrote some, some stuff to download all that data. There's a surprising number of weather stations in South Africa. Um, so this is from, I think, 1973. Uh, there's interesting effects where some of the things fade in and fade out of the, as the years go by. But, okay, so I specified there's a big bounding block that's sort of now known as South Africa, so congratulations Namibia and Botswana, you also kind of qualify as South Africa now. And then I also specified a smallest little subset of Cape Town. Um, and in this data set we can find things like a daily maximum temperature, a daily minimum temperature, and a daily precipitation and that's going to be associated with the latitude and longitude of that weather station. So we can start, we'll start off and we'll just do Cape Town, because who cares about the rest of the country, right? <laughs> I'm from Joburg, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now the other, the other um, thing that I should mention is, this is a Python conference, I've been talking about Gaussian processes, I've been talking about the weather, um, what's in it for you guys? So this is a good news talk. There are two ways of doing things in Python, there's the gpy and there's scikit-learn. Um, the Gaussian process in scikit-learn is very new, so you have to upgrade to 0 0.18. Um, so GPI was this package written by a research group in the UK. They've got loads of different kernels, loads of different or, so covariance matrices, um, loads of different methods, loads of 
all sorts of things you can flip in and flip out. Um, and this is basically the code you need to do. So once you've got some data, and bear in mind this is going to be supervised learning, so you're going to have some sort of input variable that you want to map to some sort of output variable. So we'll be thinking about things like um, maybe the day of the year getting mapped to a minimum temperature, or a day of the year getting mapped to the average, uh, the maximum. Cool, okay, so you, you get the X being the sort of day of the year, and the Y would be the temperature you actually get to observe. And we're then going to specify a kernel, so in this case it's an RBF kernel, so remember that's the thing that gives us nice smooth functions. And we're going to say, oh, we want to do some Gaussian process regression, because we want to predict values. And then we say, here's our input data, here's our, the data we want to match, and here's our kernel. And we say, okay, now go and train it. And the defaults actually do a pretty good job. And if you have a look at the scikit-learn code, it's a little bit more involved, but mainly because the package is bigger and you have to do a little bit more um, importing and whatnot. But at the end of the day, you specify a kernel, you say it's an RBF. Um, I appear to have specified it twice. And you then do Gaussian process regression, give it the kernel, and give it the data. So you then fit the data, and then you can start making predictions with that. Okay, so all I want to try and convey is that this is pretty simple code that you can sort of copy and paste and try it on your favorite data set and play around and see how well it does. Okay, so to the example I'm going to work through in the beginning is what's the maximum and minimum temperature for today without looking at a weather forecast or any current meteorology information. Okay, so it's in some ways a bit forced. It's sort of saying what's the average temperature, what's the average maximum for, say, October the 7th, what's the average minimum for October the 7th, and taking things from there. So I pulled sort of 30 odd years, 40 odd years of data, and just did a bit of averaging just to get a data set that we can start to work with. And you can see it's sort of this nice around the middle of the year when it's all cold and then it warms up again and it's sort of warmest in February, those sorts of things. And reassuringly, the maximum temperature is higher than the minimum temperature, so <laughs> it's always sensible to do some sort of sanity checking in your data. I cannot emphasize that enough. Okay, so we go and we say, Oh, sorry. Is it on? Ah, cool. Sorry, just to interject. Um, the assumption there is that the function remains the same over time. And purely because we're talking about climate here, I'm like, well, surely yes. there's, a, there's a year component here that possibly... Yes, so we're starting off with sort of very simple, small 1D things, and the initial intention was to be like, well, can we find evidence of global warming? That was my vision for this, and I was going to break it into a, a nice yearly component and a long-term trend that showed it was increasing. There's some issues in terms of actually looking at the data. Um, some of the weather stations fade in and some of them fade out, and in particular a lot of the more recent ones, I think they just haven't been released into the public domain yet and things like that. So there's less data and it's sort of more fluctuating than you'd imagine and you can't really see a nice upward trend being like oh my gosh there is global warming so that was one thing that I was hoping to see but I didn't and you can have Ray. okay hi um, this might be a very naive question so please excuse my ignorance um, so my interpretation is basically you, you're mapping a day in the year to an expected outcome. So that's like a one-to-one -one relationship. Can you take multiple inputs? Um, so uh, not just a day, maybe other values. Um, I mean, I realize so, in this so situation... You're it's, thinking it's one -one. like two-dimensional... Yeah, two-dimensional input 
to one expected outcome yes. or, or three or four or whatever. So we will get to a two-dimensional example in a couple slides. So yes, absolutely. And I'm sorry, you would get a take lot voucher, but I'm out. <laughs> Cool, okay, so that's our, something like our data set, and we want to fit um, a nice, smooth thing to it. So we literally take the code that I, well, almost the code that I, I have there, there was one slight modification, and we, we just run it, and we say fit it, and it comes out with this nice, super smooth fit to it. Um, and that's the mean estimate, and we also have error bars. So on average, 95% of our data should lie within this light blue sphere. And what's great is this can have any sort of shape, um, and it's fine. We will fit it as best we can. Um, so it's sort of an arbitrary smooth function that we're looking to model. Okay, and so we can go from min to max. Um, I, I should mention I had a look as well. It's, so we're sort of estimating something like on average it'll be 10 degrees minimum for October the 7th, and today it's actually 12. And we should see something like the 22 degrees for the maximum, and it's sort of 18. So again, trying to sense check a bit, and we're broadly in the right, in the right ballpark. Um, okay, it looks pretty similar, and so this is, to be, just to keep in mind, this is for the GPI uh, toolkit, GPI package. We've also got scikit-learn. Um, again, it produces very similar outputs, and it's lovely and smooth, and it sort of captures underlying trends quite nicely. So what impressions did I have if I wanted to comp contrast them? My impression is that GPI is a little bit more robust. Um, it's sort of more numerically stable, so you can throw data at it and things fall over less. Uh, it seems to have more features. It seems to have a lot of covariance functions, a lot of um, different methods you can try. And I think that's basically as a function of it being actively developed over several years with lots of researchers trying to come up with different methods. Um, it might be a bit slower, and again, I think this is a, a heritage of its sort of research history heritage. It's not necessarily designed for speed, it's sort of to try and look at a, a data set and, and analyze it. Um, Scikit-learn maybe is a little bit faster, we're not talking huge, hugely faster. It's still being actively developed, it's quite new, so I imagine at some point, probably Scikit-learn might overtake Okay, so we might be interested in knowing what's the warmest day. So something like February the 7th, according to our data. It's on average 16 degrees is the minimum and 28. The coldest day is July the 13th. It's sort of 6 and 18. Okay, another thing we might be interested in is Gaussian processes for classification. So now we're not trying to say, well, let's predict a temperature, which is sort of a real value, now we just want to predict an outcome. Will something happen or not? Is this the number one or the number zero? Is this um, any sort of Boolean predicate you can think of? We can start to. Okay, so this is something like the data. Okay, did it rain in Cape Town on a given day? And we've got a bunch of days that it didn't and a bunch of days that it did. Okay, so if you were to plot this, it looks kind of messy, you're not, well, it doesn't look like anything. Um, and so if I were sitting in the audience wondering, oh, how would I plot this, I'd probably end up going and bucketing it into a bunch of little buckets, adding up some sort of average, and then sort of trying to say, okay, well, here's going to be how it behaves. But we can do better than that, because if you do these bucketing things, you end up sort of like, oh, actually, maybe I can get by with slightly smaller buckets, or maybe I don't have enough data in some weird time, so I have to make buckets bigger there, and all those sorts of things. Instead, let's just plug, in, plug it into a Gaussian process, and we can just change it from a Gaussian process regression to Gaussian process classification. And we end up popping out this lovely smooth curve. And 
it has slightly steeper angle there and sort of slightly slower off there. So hopefully you're convinced that this isn't me just trying to con you by plotting some sine wave or something like that. Um, it really is a case of you sort of let it run and it pops out with something broadly sensible. Okay, um, cool. So we find out that the, let's say this is the wedding day. So if you want to have a wedding, plan it for January the 9th. It's the least likely to have a, um, to have to rain in Cape Town, something like 8%. And the rainiest day will be something like June the 26th on average. Okay, but what the hell are those inducing points? I don't know if you noticed in the figure. So now we've got something called inducing points and all these little spikes pointing up here. So it turns out that normal Gaussian processes kind of suck. And they do that in a very sort of computational, computer science kind of way. Um, they've got n cubed computational complexity. So if you want to throw small data at them, it's fine. It's lovely. I think Gaussian processes are probably the best method you can use for a small data set. And even though there's this crazy hype around big data, most people have small data sets and looking to get as much value as they can out of those small data sets. I think in that situation, you should be looking at Gaussian processes. Um, but as data sets grow, Gaussian processes get worse and they get worse in a sort of an n cubed kind of way. And so then what happens is people have come along and come up with sparse Gaussian processes. And the sort of intuition is that you want to use a small number of points to make predictions in some way, but those points somehow get influenced by all the data and you end up sort of breaking some of this n cubed behavior. So you've got sort of linear in terms of your um, data set, but n cubed still in the number of inducing points. So you end up picking a small number of inducing points and things then tend to work. Okay, and I haven't shown you any code. What, what has changed? So now you have to specify something called the number of inducing points. Um, in this case, I picked 50. Um, I picked a slightly different kernel, so I picked the periodic kernel. And I said, let's give me a sparse GP classification. And with the kernel and the number of inducing points, and then just go away and optimize it and make it fit and look beautiful. And the thing, I just want to come back, the thing to notice about making a standard periodic kernel is that normally you specify, oh, okay, if I'm at day 360, then I want to be very correlated with day 350 and day sort of 370. In this case, years wrap around, so 370 doesn't actually make sense, you actually want to come back to five. And in this case, we can just say, just, this is a periodic variable, it's going to wrap around, make sure you're correlated. You don't even have to know the period, you can just say, I think it's correlated in some sort of periodic way, and when you go away and optimize it, it actually can figure out what the right period should be. So originally I said the period should be 366, because I was worried about um, leap days, and then I went back and I checked and it had actually corrected it to 365 point something, 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 and I was quite impressed. It was like 365.01 or something. But that's probably just a fluke. Okay, so there's the code. Okay, but now coming back to this question of can you do two-dimensional things? So I've always wanted to be a weather forecaster and now I can. So. I picked a random date and I went sort of a couple years either side, so sort of eight years for a couple, or eight years in total and sort of roughly a week in each year and I just sort of averaged out the data. And so here we can see in the desert, it's nice and dry, it's a fair amount of probability of rain on the coastline, um, gets further <laughs> drier up at the top and I'm not very good at this, maybe I'll stick to my day job. Uh, okay, so what ended up changing in this case? Well, we obviously had to provide more data, so we had to now give the 
latitude and longitude, and now we've sort of smushed the various days of the, of the year together. And we just now say, oh, we've actually got two input dimensions. Um, we want to do some sort of classification, so we're still predicting what's the chance of rain. And we just tell it to run and go do its thing. Okay, uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> Right. Uh, who has questions? Hi. So um, I assume that in your last example, it was still periodic on days, but not on x and y coordinates. Um, and so how do you deal with that? So in this case, I completely ignored the day of the year. I just said, OK, we're going to take, these are all somehow similar in the time of the year. So I picked from sort of I don't know if it was January or February, and just basically said, here's some data for this point. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just latitude and longitude and whether it rained or not. And it all gets sort of averaged out. So it's not really even a weather forecast or a... Yeah. Right. Um, so you, you said these press is obviously infinite dimensional, um, so then the order n cubed is in the number of data points. Yes, yeah, so the maths works out nicely that conceptually it's infinite, but any time but anytime you want to make a prediction, you only ever want to predict a finite number of these. And so it's, it turns out that the dimensions you don't observe that, or that you don't want to predict or condition on, they just disappear. They are you sort of marginalize them out as the technical okay. term. So is, is that using the, the kernel trick, um, like with SVMs, or is this different? Uh, no, no, so it is different. Um, it's just, it's a property of the normal distribution. Okay. I, yeah. I noticed the confidence for, for the rainfall was basically from zero to one. Is there a way of... Um, yeah, so that's their way of saying in this current method we don't have meaningful confidence intervals. Um, it's just, yeah, this is what we estimate it to be and trust us, I guess. <laughs> um, are there any further questions? Yes, there are. Over here. Mm, is there any possibility of learning the kernel parameters in GPI? Like the scale parameters was fixed to one and the length to one, but then is there a possibility to learn the parameters from the data itself? Okay, so I did not explain myself well then. Um, you are absolutely right. Let's pick a slightly. So the code does all of this. So when you actually go and fit this model, you say here's some input data, here's some uh, output targets that we want to capture, we want to model, or make predictions about. Um, it goes and it fits everything using the variance and the length scale. And then you go and you say, let's optimize these things. And it absolutely does optimize the variance and optimize the length scale. So you're 100% you're right, and I didn't explain that here. There was a question here. Was it time? Um, do either of GPI or scikit-learn provide kind of helpers for constructing your own kernels? Say if you had two uh, position variables and then a day of the year which is periodic, how would one construct that? So I'm not sure about the helper stuff, but there are some great examples. Um, Uh, if we do something like <coughs> so there's this great example and it's it, it convinced me about the power of these um, Gaussian processes. So here exactly as you're saying, you can compose these kernel functions um, and you can start to say, okay, well, 
let me tell you a bit about this fi figure first. So it's the CO2 concentrations based on measurements made in Hawaii. And there's a strong seasonal component. So every sort of summer it goes up or every winter it goes down or something like that. But there's also long-term trends going on here. And if we want to make some sort of prediction, we should bear in mind both of these or else we'll look kind of weird and kind of off. And so they go and they build a um, covariance function that takes into account both the seasonal and the long-term trend. And what's great is as you then make these predictions further out, your predictions, your error bars grow. And you get this feeling of, well, that things could maybe get better, maybe things will get worse, who knows. There's a worrying follow-up to this picture, which was made sort of a couple years ago, which shows that we are actually quite close to the top of the, the error bars. So <coughs> business as usual is getting worse. Uh, there's a question here at the back. Um, hi, I just want to ask, what's your personal preference between JPI and Skykit-Learn? And you've mentioned that um, Skykit-Learn is a lot faster than JPI. Um, what reason would anyone have to use JPI? I'm, yeah. So, Scikit Learn is a lot newer, um, but that sounds like an advantage, and I don't think it is. I think the Scikit Learn stuff still needs a bit more robust numerical things. I think it still needs a bit more in terms of functionality. Um, so there are some parameters that don't get optimized in Scikit Learn, but do get optimized in, in GPI, and that can actually make quite a big difference in your performance. So a lot of, almost all the pictures I made were from GPI, and I quite liked it. I don't have strong preferences. I think just in general, we should be using them. Do we have any more questions? No more questions. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you.